Okay, Lynn, you're going to say a few words yes. before the... I'm going to try to translate what was said already. Ah. I, mean, I know that... Ah, I thought there might be an agenda. I, I, I have, I have a, a great teachers here, and I think I have some idea of, of, what, the, of what they were saying, and I just, I just w- want to summarize, go back a minute. Simon, Sam, Stephen, sorry, Steve Bell has an assumption that's verified by everything they do, and that is that Darwin was completely right that all life on Earth has common ancestry. And you tell that by the biochemistry of replication. Is that not right? That in spite of things that happen afterwards, there's no other form of life, in fact, in the entire solar system or universe that we know of. The life on Earth is all from common ancestry, and today's lineage has DNA as the, as the reproductive molecule. Then we can start arguing, and we'll start arguing next. He shows a topology that all life comes from a common ancestry, and I think all Darwinians, we completely agree, do we not? Everybody agrees. It's a brilliant insight of Darwin that we can laud. But the concept that the tree is the right topology I think is very wrong. It's very wrong. Even Woe's tree. Because a tree assumes that the lineages continue to branch and branch and branch from the common ancestor. And Stephen Bell himself showed that there was movement of genetic material from one branch to another. That makes the topology a net, a web, and no longer a tree. That's the basic point I want to make. That's discussable. Then if we go to, uh, to um, Martin, I would have said the man back there, the, the geology student, I don't, are you still there? Yeah. Is it you? <laughs> What's your name? William. Yes, William. I would have thought you would say, like Wilberforce, like Huxley, saying about Wilberforce, uh, the Lord hath delivered him into my hands when he was asked on what side of your, of your, of your family is, are, you, are you evolved from? An ape? Is it your grandfather's side or your mother's side? Why? Because William is pointing out, I think, an amazing point that, that uh, Martin really didn't express, uh, that all of us understood it took me a long time to understand. I'm not sure I understand it yet. But the idea is that not just the individual or the animal is the, is the um, unit of selection. And not just a, a community is a unit of selection. A community are populations of organisms in the same place in the same time. Those forams that he was talking about, although they seem like single cells, are communities because they have the, the, the ones doing the agriculture inside, you know, the photosynthetic ones, the diatoms and the, and the green algae and the uh, yellow green algae that he mentioned inside. Those are the farmers inside the bodies. These, these forams are body farming. They are the shelled marine organisms that are growing their own food by growing their plant-like, they're not plants at all, but plant-like the algae inside the tests. And therefore, what is the unit of selection? At the very minimum, the unit of selection is the 4M and it's algae. And if we count genomes there, we have usually three for the algae and three or four for the 4Ms. We have seven different genomes. So clearly, the unit of selection isn't a single gene or a single genome. Why? I love Richard's me- metaphor that, of the selfish gene because it focuses attention on the science behind natural history. But of course it's just a metaphor because a gene doesn't have a self. A gene's not a self. How can something be selfish if it has no self? The self, and I think he uses it metaphorically, Men, maybe he'll argue with me. But. The self is the cell. All cells have self, and the self has been forgotten. And even in hearts and livers, the self has been forgotten. And this is my introduction to arguing the topology that's taught is not right. 
in my opinion, the, the idea that accumulation of random mutations is the way species change from one species to another, has very little evidence for it. And that, <laughs> um, and that junk DNA is just another way of saying we don't know what the DNA is doing. Is that not what you said, Dennis? That's not what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Yes, I, uh, you're next. So I'm, <laughs> saying, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that, that what Dennis is trying to point out, that as we learn more and more, first of all, that there's just too, numerically, it's just too, too many possibilities, and, we, and, the, and the numbers expressed are very much smaller. And we just can't play with the numbers. The idea that there's junk protein or junk DNA is, as Jonathan Barr just said, it's, it's not a useful idea. It's not a useful idea. The idea that there is something and reasons for these, for these po the enormous number of possibilities leads you to seek the reasons. You don't know what they are. We don't know what they are. But Dennis's point is that uh, let's not assume that there's no reason behind this, this so-called junk DNA or these protein combinatorics where there's so many of them. Well, I want to go back to make one point that's expressed in this film, and that is the unit of life on Earth is the cell, and there are two kinds of cells, and I mean, he said prokaryotic and eukaryotic, but just think this way, bacteria-like cells and animal, plant, fungal, and so-called nucleated cells. Those are the two kinds of life. And yes, there's a lot of, com lot of our Archae, archaea, as Stephen Bell said, archaea background in all nucleated organisms. But there's all sorts of eubacteria also. So this is what I wanted to show you in this film. First of all, that we're going to act on the self, the real self level, and that's the cell level. The cell, even a bacterial cell, shows all the properties of life all the time. And it's bounded by a membrane that must be there to define the self. All of those cells have the potential to reproduce at rates beyond the environment. No environment can ever support the prodigious potential for reproduction of any life form. And the fact that the life forms do not continue into the future is natural selection. That's what natural selection is, the fact that the life forms don't continue. So what I want to show you is a, a film of 14 minutes that shows our current model uh, idea of how we got the, the animal type cell. Now when I say animal type cell, I really mean plant cell, protoctus cell, fungal cell, uh, molds, yeast, fungi, all of these cells that we study in biology classes and that we don't study in microbiology classes. So we have two kinds of cells. The bacterial type cell that has no uh, familiar organelles including the nucleus and the other kinds of cells which are the typical biology that we all study. Now how do we go from a bacterial type cell that has a single continuous genome in it to all the nucleated cells which have more than one. And the argument is going to be a product of symbiosis, two kinds of symbionts at the very base, and one of them is Simon's archae, arche, archaebacteria to me, but archaebacteria, that, that kind of cell. And the other is another familiar cell it, um, that's not familiar, it's notorious. Because that kind of cell is known to medical people as the cause, th that kind of cell, it's a phylum of eubacteria, for those of you into bi mi microbiology. Phylum of eubacteria. Um, they're called spirochetes, and you know them because they cause syphilitic cankers, and they cause Lyme disease, and so on. That's how they're familiar, because the medical profession deals with the freaks. But the claim here is going to be that this kind of cell was intimately involved in an archaebacterial cell, the kind of cell that Steve, Stephen Bell was talking about, in the first fusion to form these little protists, protoctus. And that occurred before there was oxygen 
freely around in the atmosphere. There's always traces, but before the big oxygen conversion. And, I, and what I, the only point here is that I'm not going to show you anything but live material. So I'm going to show, well, I, that's not true. There's a diagram. There's, there's Jim McAllister's back there over there did the animation. Though there's, there's an animation to make the live material clearer and put it in the order that we think is a temporal order. You know. Anyway, so the, the film will start with the spirochetes, which are the ancestors, if we're correct, to the sperm tails of more than half the people in the room and the oviduct cilia of the others. <laughs> so between you, we all have those. So anyway, we, we're going to see those organisms on their own. Then we're going to see the archaeobacterium, which is a crenarchaeota. It's thermo... well, I mean, it's close to it. You say thermoplasma's not in it? That's a UD. Yeah, okay, well... We can discuss this th Yeah, though, that's fine. It's a sulfur, it's a sulfidogen, a sulfidogenic acid tolerant um, organism that is our best bet right now for the archaeobacterial component. So we have a eubacterial component and archaeobacterial by themselves. And then we're going to have all these organisms that are swimming around together, and then we'll end up with a eukaryote at the end. And we're, there's no missing links in the sense that we have everything represented in the live material. So that's that's... And you're going to have to sit over there. Yeah, we, we've turned the lights down now. Oh, off, off, off. Off. <laughs> this word means the origin of nucleated cells, the familiar cells of animals, plants, fungi, protoctus, which would mean algae and all sorts of others. Now, this is a spirochete bacterium. It's a eubacterium with the eubacteria type of replication that Simon, that Stephen mentioned. And this one, these are um, still photos. We need to see what they are live. First of all, they can't tell their faces from their ends, their other ends, like pe some people we know, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> they go full. This is a, this, there are many, many spirochetes in the picture. It's the large one that we see very clearly. It translates as it rotates. That is, it rotates as it moves forward and rotates as it moves back. And it has a corkscrew type of morphology, which means that it wins races with lots of bacteria when there's, the medium is viscous, when, there's, when it's gel-like. And you'll see that there's some much smaller ones in the background. It's a gram-negative bacterium that has bacterial flagella in its periplasm. That is between its inner membrane, which is the classical cell membrane, and the outer membrane. And develops huge concentrations, and, and these organisms interact. Now, there are some spirochetes. These are from microbial mats. This is a different one. Th that when they are threatened by many things, well, here, here's a diatom, this is outside in, in marine water. Uh, this is the spirochete in question, which I'll explain in a minute. Now, this is a cyanobacterium that's producing both food and oxygen. And these spirochetes have learned to chase them. Now, watch that. This is light sensitive. The reason these spirochetes are light sensitive is because they like to stay in the sunlight where their food is produced. They follow their food. This means that the sensitivity to sunlight and to mechanical stimulation and many other things, of course, chemo sensitivity, are already present in this group of organisms. They are not photosynthetic at all, they just stay in the light. Now, this is a strobe light view. Because if you had the real spirochetes, it looks like this. They swim together, and we know that they're not permanently associated because if we add water, they just swim in all over the place. And if we remove the water slowly, you'll get this kind of, not water, usually more viscous media, but you will get this kind of group behavior. Now, it is a property of the entire group that's been studied that when conditions become unfavorable, they form what are known as round bodies, vesicles, there's all sorts of names for them, cysts in some cases, but they actively form them. Watch this one.
and they produce these round bodies that actually have spore-like structures. They're not at all um, boil-proof or anything, but they are desiccation-resistant. And here's a round body formed. This one is in the process of forming one. And what they do is they swell up their outer membranes, and they bring their bodies inside. Here's, here's the swelling starts first. The only reason we have this in this particular series of shots is because we changed the medium to a kind of food they don't like. So watch this. So you have in these bacteria sensitivity to light, to touch and um, uh, mechanical activity. Since here is a, a, an electron micrograph of the spirochete moving in and forming a spore-like structure. And they will wait for, for, we know, for at least, I think, five years before they come out again. Now, in this, this is in the South Pacific. This is just a group of algae, brown algae. And the white stuff here... Was, please take that photo off me. Please. Turns out to be this spirochete that is requiring sulfide, HS minus ion, or H2S gas. It's the same one as this. This is the Massachusetts version. The other is the Russian version. And to, to conquer the, the threat of atmospheric oxygen, they produce sulfur and deposit it. Now, this is a change of scene completely. This is the archaebacterium that we think developed the association with the spirochetes in the origin of the earliest nucleated organisms. And if you look carefully, they have little processes, they have little things sticking out, and we'll see what that looks like at the electron micrograph. Now, these organisms generate sulfide. The spirochetes would like them because they, 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 they go toward the sulfide. And in the presence of the oxygen, they will also excuse me, they will use the sulfide, this, this uh, bright stuff is elemental sulfur. They will use the sulfur, this terminal electron acceptor, and if you don't get that, that's a, all right. They lose, use the sulfur, and they use these hydrogens from their food and generate sulfide. Now, this is another scanning electron micrograph of exactly those same bacteria. And notice that they are pleomorphic, that is, they don't have a rigid cell. We assume that the sulfur globule dropped out in the preparation. And here we have one, two, three, four, five, six. And the concept here is that this is the other partner that developed a relationship with spirochetes to form this. Now, this is a eukaryotic structure. This is, these are cilia or undulopodia. As you, these are the, this is the DNA associated with the cilia that, that are underneath the nuclear membrane, and that's just plain nuclei. And if you section the cilia or any underlipodia or your sperm tails or your oviduct cilia, you find that nine two organization, that nine sets of microtubules. This organism is affectionately called rubberneckia because it makes a complete circle of its nucleus. This is the nucleus in here, and this is a typical organism that has at least seven different bacteria making it up. And the reason we have that here is because the nucleus, the undulopodia, kinetosome, centrioles, uh, and the Golgi uh, fall off in, in an easy way so that they have a structure that's been known for years to the old-timey um, protozoologists that probably represents the earliest step in the origin of the nucleus. Here is the nucleus of that organism, rubbernechia. Now, this is the poster child of what we're saying. Now, what do I mean? This organism is called Mixotricha paradoxa, which means mixed up hairs paradoxical. In 1956 or so, Cleveland went to Australia to study this organism. Here's its nucleus and nuclear connector. To study this organism because he was told it had flagella and cilia on the same organism. Those are, that's both wrong. This is a symbiotic complex of about 400 thousand different bacteria and this is the nucleus then the nuclear connector and this particular one well you can see it in the live cell you could a minute ago the nucleus and the nuclear connector mixotricha has is a trichomonad like trichomonas vaginalis but it's a hundred times larger and these things that look so much like cilia turn out to be the treponeme spirochete and a, another kind of a bacillus shaped bacterium and we have 100,000 of these and 100,000 of these per single mixotricha. And before division, 
Okay, so here's one bacterium and the other bacterium, and we have something that looks very much like the cortex of a ciliate, but it isn't. It's two kinds of spirochetes and one other kind of bacterium. Furthermore, in the same habitat that this organism lives, and on the organism itself is another bacterium, a spirochete, morphologically indistinguishable from the Lyme disease spirochete, and that's at the base of the, the back of Mixotrichia. So here's Mixotrichia, it's like a garbage truck. It goes forward in this direction and senses in this direction and takes in wood in the back. And if we go to the back portion, we see even another kind of symbiotic bacterium. So here's, these are the treponeme spirochetes. These are two different other kinds of spirochetes. This cortex is made up of the, and this is another organism living in the same habitat where the rear, the back end are all spirochetes and the front end are completely evolutionary homologous. This is the back end, those are spirochetes. The front end are the evolutionary homol homologs to your sperm tails or oviduct cilia as the case may be because they have nine tubule, arrays of nine tubules. These are, this is a different, still a different spirochete that has tubules in the cytoplasm. We don't know the composition but they, the tubules are coming out of a cytoplasmic tubule associated center here. What we're saying is that the sensitivity to light, to mechanoreception, to chemoreception, and tubules themselves evolved in spirochetes. Now this, this is a bacterial flagellum, and on the inside of that flagellum are cytoplasmic tubules, but they are, they are not the same as those found in eukaryotes, but they show you that spirochetes have a whole range. Now this is a single cell mating with five other bacteria simultaneously. These are sperm, that's the sperm, and these are the naked tails. No DNA, no mitochondria, no membranes. These are the naked tails, and they move like, like spirochetes because that's where they started from. They will only last about 45 uh, minutes, but they do last long enough to photograph that. And if you weaken the protein bonds in the sperm tails with a little trypsin, the, the sets of doublet tubules extend, they're trying to move and undulate, but they can't, so they extend the fragments nine times the size, so that you know the, they're, they're the sperm again. It doesn't matter whether the sperm have their DNA or mitochondria at all, their tails act. Now this is what the sperm tails look like. Nine sets of doublet microtubules with two in the center. Now we know that these motility apparatus of the uh, nine plus two, that here are nine plus twos in this particular cell, are directly involved with the origin of the mitotic spindle and the mitosis process. Here is mitosis in, in one of these protists, doesn't have any mitochondria. The protists uh, have the, these are the heads of them, they have the nine plus two apparatus. Now this film is a work in progress, obviously, and it's not finished. But anyway, here we have in a fungus, a microtubule um, organizing center. At any rate, here's another kind of protist, and like many of them, if it's doing cell division, it has a lot of trouble swimming because it's using the swimming undulopodia cilia microtubules for mitosis, and it can't do both at the same time. This is a, a culture of all the same, that you've seen all the same protists in this particular picture. Now, such an organism acquired mitochondria from ingestion and failure to digest respiring bacteria, and then later such an organism that already had undulopodia and already had mitochondria ingested but did not digest cyanobacteria to become an alga, basically. And all of the action is in this structure. This is, a, this is, this is tubulin, this is, these are the proteins and DNA associated with the centrioles, centrosomes, and all the rest of that. Now here's our cartoon. The spirochetes are attracted to the sulfide being generated by the archaebacterium. Now both the spirochetes and the archaebacterium have their entire set of genes and their replication apparatus. The 
pressure, selection pressure that's maintaining them both, they're both heterotrophs and they're both fermenting, is that the motility that the spirochetes attach is about 60 times faster than the motility in the archaeobacterium by itself. And the archaeobacterium, on the other hand, is sticking to the sulf sulfur and generating sulfide. So under these conditions, we have a syntrophy where the spirochetes are attracted to the sulfide and the nucleus connector evolves as a way of keeping the symbionts together in a sulfide-rich environment away from the oxygen, but oxygen leaks in and, and under those conditions sulfide is, is um, oxidized to sulfur. This whole organism, that whole, this whole symbiotic complex becomes a sulfur syntrophy motile structure in which there is a, 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 a bacterial conjugation leading to, and, and a lot of membrane proliferation, leading to the very earliest eukaryotes. This is not LUCA, the last universal common ancestor, it's LECA, the last eukaryotic common ancestor. And they're beginning to look like what people call little mastigotes or flagellates. And here we have oxygen rising, oxygen rising, and the, this is an alpha proteobacterium, or probably a, a, another pro, non-alpha proteobacterium, but one that respires oxygen totally. We now have the origin of the mitochondria and inside, and phagocytosis is rampant here. And so we have the ingestion and failure to digest cyanobacteria. So we now have really an alga. It has two of the nine plus two structures that are used in the mitotic process. It has become oxygen using and, and uh, well, this is the greatest bacterium of all because it makes all the food and handles oxygen. Now, we have legacies of this. This is an electron micrograph of a, an A mitochondria, a cell that has no mitochondria. And here we see that the undulopodium, the 9 plus 2, is attached directly to the mitotic apparatus. And here's another example of a different organism. Again, we have the centriole kinetosome, and here is the cilium, or the undulopodium in this case, and it's attached, attached on the other side to the nucleus. Enough. We will not press the credits. Okay, so I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> then just let the, I, I mean, it seems to me that one way of interpreting what you're saying is that inheritance is not just DNA. Certainly. Right, so do we have to redefine a gene? You see, it seems to me that what has happened, let, let me just explain the background to this. What has happened is that effectively molecular biology has redefined what a gene is. It's become a sequence of DNA. It used that's, to be a factor. That's in not what it matter. was originally. Now, the question, I think, is, is that, <laughs> to use a phrase that was used in an earlier question, is that a useful and, and helpful way of looking at it? Is what? Or, is what? Um, the molecular biological definition of a gene, because even that has got into trouble now with the intron exon story and the epigenetics that has to go with all of that. Um, now, my, my question really to you and possibly to the rest of us as panelists before we <coughs> open the discussion up is do we really have to redefine what a gene is or do we abandon um, the name gene to the molecular biologists and come up with some new name for whatever it is that is important in inheritance? Well, see, I, I think it's unnecessary to abandon the, the, the idea that DNA is a piece of, uh, that genes are pieces of DNA. Okay. I think what's totally crucial is to recognize that the minimal unit of cell, of, of life, is always a cell, and therefore it's always a gene in a context of protein synthesis and, and uh, energy transfer and so on. And, and that is the unit of heredity. It's it's not that the gene is an yes, the I gene mean, is the blueprint. Got, it's not it's not the building. Th this is partly a problem of how you describe biology, isn't it? Yes. You've got either to abandon, if that's the right word, the use of the word gene to the molecular biologists, 
and then say that inheritance is more than DNA, or you've got to go back to something like the original idea of a gene. That's, I think, the point I'm making. Then I would just suggest that... Yeah. Well, maybe we just simply put that on the table for the moment. Um, do any of the other panellists want to come in before we start to raise or uh, out open the discussion to the floor, as it were? Open. First of all, questions, obviously, to, to Lynn on what, what she's yeah. shown in her film. Yes, you came in earlier, but I think if you say your name again, it helps the recording. Robert Siegel, I, I have uh, a couple of fundamental questions. One is that you paint this view that the, the bigger organism is in charge, and one of the principles of microbiology is that the smaller organism is almost always in charge. No, I don't speak about in charge. Well, in turn, you said it takes up, you said the cell takes up the other one. I, that, I mean it by phagocytosis, a property only found in eukaryotes. It, it, it's, it does. it's not, it's actually it's not true because. Because what happens is there are microorganisms that actually have the ability to go inside cells and it's they actually force it. About but that's how, that's how, you know, lots and lots, all viruses have the ability to force the well, cells viruses to take are them not out. Organisms. That's well, not that's there. the second point I want to make, and that is in terms of a unit of selection, uh, viruses are clearly a unit of selection. In fact, they're a much more rapid unit of selection, and cells take up their genes and pass back and forth between them all the time. So, so just as a, in, in the most basic form, you can't actually argue that cells are the basic unit of, in, of uh, selection because there are smaller I said, things. I didn't say that. There I are said smaller things. Are, I said cells are the basic unit of life. That's a definitional thing. I mean, it's all definitional. No, no, is biology there's is nothing not about less than like a cell that shows all properties of life. Viruses are part, are, uh, only show them when they get into other cells. Lives. And it's a you know, question of telling uh, a bull from the time he's before and after he dies. I mean, there really is a difference. Yes, you, you want to come. Say your name. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jacob Lemieux. Um, I, it seems like an alternate explanation for the, uh, the the shared organization of the, I think it was the nine micro. What, what is what is an alternate? I have to finish. Um, the shared the the nine microtubules in the the with the, the two pairs of those. Yeah. Is it it evolved beforehand and then was passed to the spirochetes and then the you know the sperm and the. Egg. The evidence is the other way. Which but evidence? The single tubules are present for much smaller standard size in spirochetes, but the nine plus two organization is only found, as far as I know, in eukaryotic cells, and that probably it co-evolved with eukaryotes. I don't know that. If we had a nine plus two spirochete, we could argue the other way. But right now, we can only argue that the nine plus two evolved in eukary eukaryotes, but the important point is that they are all homo homologs. Nobody is going to disagree with that that this structure, which is always a quarter of a micron wide, and it's 12 microns long, it has the 9 plus 2, is they are evolutionary homologs of each other, so they have a common ancestor. Whether they came from the microbiology to begin with, from the bacteria to begin with, or whether they came in the earliest eukaryotes, we don't know. But that they came as a com that there's common ancestry there that we can say definitively, because there are about six hundred proteins involved in there in common. Okay? Can I first see if there's any further questions directly to Lynn, and then I was going to open up to more general discussion. There's somebody over here, then here, and then uh, I'm going to bring Eric in. Please, say your name. Charles. <coughs> yeah, my name is Chaz Salmon. Um, I study medical anthropology. Um, I was hoping to follow up on the question that Dr. Noble asked you. Um, regarding if if when we start to look at the relationships between these organisms that develop, the suggestion that you made was that DNA may not, the level of inheritance may not be at DNA. And when you gave the analogy of the gene being the blueprint and the organism being the building, doesn't, it, this, doesn't the, the notion of symbiogenesis suggest that the blueprint is within this relationship between these organisms? And the level of inheritance is actually this relationship that's passed on, yes. not so much the, co the composite genes themselves, or composite pieces of DNA. And that maybe what we should redefine as the gene would be that relationship. And that's certainly one way of solving it. But the recognition that the genes by themselves uh, 
are the uh, program the rest of the cell. The, the, they have, the genes by themselves can be flushed down the toilet with no, with no struggle. That is, they have no self, because in order to show the properties of life, and we can talk about what those are, but they're always material and energy flow, you have to have more than the gene. You have to have the system of the gene expressing itself in, and we heard a little bit about that today. And in my view, that's a cell minimum. It's also something much larger than the cell often. Nothing less than that. A virus absolutely does not uh, fit that definition. And I would turn to the Chilenos, who, who did this formally, and they called it autopoiesis. They called it self-maintaining. They said something. When I was a student, I was taught that evolution was, I disagree with all of it now, evolution was entities that replicate, that mutate, and replicate their mutations. And therefore, grandmothers like me and uh, mules who are infertile are not li alive because they don't replicate, they don't pass their mutation. And, and I would say that it's, it's the definition that way that's the problem, it's that, that kind of definition. And that the minimal unit that shows absolutely every aspect of life is an autopoetic one, which means that it has a boundary, and that boundary is inevitably at least a lipoprotein membrane. Sometimes it's more, but it's always a lipoprotein membrane, and that that, that body, that entity, can um, um, maintain itself always with energy flow, and the energy is almost, all, it's chemical or light, usually, and that uh, it's also by itself able to build up matter, and it's not programmed from the outside at all. It's from the inside that these properties, that this autopoiesis exists, it comes from the inside. It also, of course, has to be in an environment that permits this. But at any rate, I would say that the minimal autopoietic entity is a bacterial cell. Most of the diversity of life is in the bacteria to begin with, in the bacteria sense of life. Too. And that a virus is absolutely not that at all. It never will be. It can't be in principle. There's nothing food or energy that you can give a virus to make it show the minimal properties of life. And so I would say that the unit of heredity is that, and whether we call it a gene or we call it a cell, I mean, that should, it has to be discussed, but we at least should be talking about the same thing. I'm going to hold the, that particular point there and also hold on coming to the next question, because I think, Richard, you want just, to... I mean, I think we're being quite yeah. unnecessarily confused here. <laughs> the cell is the minimal unit of, of, of living function. Of course it is. But that's not the unit of heredity. The unit of heredity is DNA, or <laughs> RNA under some circumstances. Um, we're just confusing a unit of life, which is a cell, with a unit of heredity, which is DNA, stroke RNA. Well, that, that's what I'm not sure about. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I were to want to send to one of those Goldilocks, Goldilocks planets that the astronomers think they've found, um, the information necessary for them to reconstruct life here on Earth, it would obviously make no sense for me to put on a CD the whole of a human genome. That, that's, that's, correct. That's, correct. that's correct. Okay, that, that much is obvious. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would have to send uh, the whole of at least a fertilized egg cell information on that CD for them to even begin. I mean, let's forget for the moment about the complexity that you need a womb and all the rest of it too. Um, but I'd have to send the whole of that to the Goldilocks planet too. Now, it seems to me that what, what part of our difficulty is here is what do we mean by inheritance? Because to me, that means that we inherit the whole fertilized egg cell. And indeed, we inherit more because we inherit the maternal and paternal influences on that egg cell as it develops. Um, so is this a matter of defining what we mean by inheritance? And are we, as it were, prescribing that it shall only be the DNA Can I inheritance. Uh, Can yes, I, I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's um, right. <laughs> when you send your, when you seed life to your Goldilocks planet, yeah. you have to send the information, the DNA, plus the, the water and the, all the other Indeed. things that are to that's necessary. Right. Now, the key point that makes the difference between hereditary substance code and all the other stuff is this. 
if you mutate the non-hereditary part, for example, right. if you, um, you make some kind of manipulation to the cell, yeah. not the hereditary part, but, yeah. to, but to, the, to the cell, that will not be transmitted to the next generation. If you mutate the DNA part, it will. Yeah. Now, <laughs> if, you, if you mutate the, the, the non-DNA part, yeah. you may well scupper the whole enterprise. I mean, that, that's possible. But what you won't get is a copy of, I mean, if you, if you cut a, a cell or, or make, a, make yeah. a blemish in it in, in some way, or a blemish in an organism, um, it will not be passed on to, the, to future generations. If you make a blemish in the DNA, it will. That is the key point, certainly from a Darwinian point of view, there's an absolutely watertight operational definition of the distinction between the true hereditary part of the entire enterprise. The entire enterprise you need to send to the planet, that's, that's not in doubt, the right. entire yeah. shooting match, the entire shot. Sure. Um, but, but if you change a bit of it, and the change is inherited, that's heredity. Well, now, if I change um, a cell by taking, say, an egg cell from another species and I put a genome <coughs> into that cell, I can get development up to a certain point, and then it, it doesn't. There are extremely few cases of um, cross species cloning that lead to a living organism. And what that tells me is that. The genetic program, if we can use that metaphor for a moment, lies as much in the cell as it lies in the genome. And I think this is a matter of language, how we choose to describe the biology that we now know about. Mm -hmm. And to the question whether cellular inheritance can occur and whether inheritance over and above the transmission of DNA can occur, um, I think that the development of epigenetics has thrown a car for horses through that Now you're talking, I mean, the, yeah. the, that, because that's coming close to yeah. being a difficult borderline case. The reason it doesn't actually drop, drive a, whatever you said, a coach and horses through it, is that the epigenetic pseudo-inheritance dies away after three or four generations. Well, that's what we're not sure about. Okay, well, who's proven that? Okay, now, if it does, if it yeah. doesn't, if it goes on forever, yeah. then it's a fully paid up pucker form of genetics. But then we have to redefine what we mean by a gene. Yes, we do. It's if clearly that, if not that happens, the but the, key, the, key, the, key, the key question is: yeah. Does it go on from yes, or does that's, it just fade away? That's the question that I think is an empirical question. Of <coughs> that's an empirical yeah. question. Okay, uh, but I don't want to dominate this discussion, or that Richard should either. Yeah. Um, there's plenty of uh, further things that Key and I can discuss, I'm sure. But let's go back. You wanted to come in. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Uh, my name is Alexis Gallagher. Uh, I, and a couple of the disagreements here, I've heard the argument phrased in terms of this or that is the unit of selection. And uh, I was just wondering if everyone here can agree on what they mean by unit of selection when they say that. Because it seems like that's sometimes wielded as a razor to uh, simplify the problem, but actually it strikes me as a somewhat, uh, a phrase that has ambiguities embedded in it. And I just wondered if there was an operational definition that everyone's actually on board with before we keep using that phrase. Um, who wants to come in on this? I'm going to hold you back for a moment, Richard, OK? <laughs> uh, Martin, you're, you're shaking your head. I you? No, uh, he, he passes. <laughs> right. Stephen, do you want to come in on this? Frankly, no. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, but he leaves Lynn and Richard and possibly me, but I know nothing about this. Over to you, Lynn, first. And then I'll ask Richard to say something. Well, what do we mean by unit of selection? Question. And it's related totally to the, where is Gallagher? Yes, hi. Um, it's related totally to the, to the heredity issue. It's related, w one of the things I didn't mention, but with this autopoietic entity idea where the cell is minimal, and I, don't, I think we have agreement on that, is that it's got identity. Now, cells have identity. And, and uh, when, when Dennis said that he doesn't know of many cases, and it's certainly true, in animals, where you get cross, you get hybridization between members of different, you know, slightly different species or something. I was going to give you a case where you have hybridization, that is, you have a new organism formed routinely by a fertilization like fusion between members of different kingdoms. They're not animals. <laughs> They're not animals. But my point is that you have an identity there. And the one I'm talking about has a name, it looks like a plant, it's not a plant at all, and so on. 
In that case, it is clear the identity is given by the naturalist. A name is given by the naturalist. And we have identity, and the name of that one is geosiphon. Fine. Geosiphon only is made when a member of one kingdom is fertilized by a member of another kingdom, and you end up with this little moss-like thing that is not a plant and not a moss at all, but it superficially looks like it. That's identity. And what is heredity? It's the inheritance of that entity in nature. To me, it's got to be in nature, right? And so is that an individual? <clears throat> it's certainly not a virus. It's certainly a lot more than a virus. It's certainly cellular. And I would say that when you have this identity and you have these parents and they produce a living organism, that you have a, a heredity system, a heritable system. And it was gonna, it's going to last as long as that identity persists. But that's group selection. And I would say that that Martin's discussion of the large forums showed that, in fact, everybody, they don't even, they're not even aware usually that those are symbionts. They're just aware that they're forums with their own specific names. And he's showing that it's a, a group in the sense that there's cells from different origins and all of that. And, and the, the unit that is persisting has an identity, persists, has offspring. It's a heritable unit. And it's a minimal heritable unit, and it's a lot more than a piece of DNA. That's my opinion. Before I bring you back, or whether you're satisfied with that, Richard, do you want to come in on unit of selection? You must be... <laughs> have you had 30 years of talking about units of selection? There are two different meanings of the, of the phrase unit of selection. Replicator and vehicle. The replicator is that which persists through time, and that is DNA or RNA or something like it. That is to say, a coded information which is, is copied exactly, subject to occasional mutation, just like computer data is copied, just like Xeroxing is copied. The vehicle is, is quite different. The vehicle might be a cell, it might be an individual. It is the unit which we observe in nature to survive or not survive, to reproduce or not reproduce. We, we observe wildebeest, some of them die, some of them don't. We observe lions, some of them die, some of them don't. This is vehicle selection. That's what we actually see out there in, in nature. But the long-term evolutionary consequence is the differential survival of replicators, DNA mostly, which exist inside those vehicles. And you can talk about natural selection at either of those two levels. You can even talk about group selection if you must. <laughs> in which case the group you're talking about will be a vehicle but it will be some kind of joint unity of, of vehicles and bodies or something like that which has a certain coherence to it I don't think it's helpful to talk about group selection um, but I do think it's helpful to make the distinction between replicator selection which is something very very precise it's the differential survival of alternative pieces of coded information and vehicle selection which, it, which means different things to botanists and zoologists, and, and it, 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 it's a mess. But, but there are times when you do need to, to, to talk about it. Do you want to come back on... You, you triggered this particular debate. Do, do you want to come back on any of that? Uh, I don't think I do, actually. I was, I was very curious if people agreed on what they meant by the term when they were using it. I, I'm aware that, that it's uh, trickier than it sounds. Um, the answer is a straight no, they don't agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, but let me, let me, yes, uh, it's just allowing the Richard's point of the replicator. It brings up the interesting point that a given gene on a chromosome, you tend to view it as a sequence in isolation that is a gene and that becomes a heritable unit. <coughs> but of course that gene in isolation is nothing without the ability of that DNA to be replicated. And in many cases the actual sequences that define replication and duplication of that DNA can be related can be considerable distance away from that particular gene. So then we have this sort of duality or sort of bifurcation of the definition because we have to have those sequences that govern replication of that gene. So is that the actual unit, would you say? Or, or what? The, from, a, from a field point of view, it would be that which makes the difference between indi individuals. Yes. <coughs> let, let, me, let me put a question to you then, Stephen, and perhaps also to, to Lynn. Um, <coughs> if I've understood part of what you were saying, then um, 
forms of cells must have emerged quite early on. Right. So early on there had to be cellular inheritance. Right? So far, so good. Now, why should that have disappeared? Or, or to put the point in the terms that uses Richard's terminology, um, aren't cells also very good replicators right from the very beginning? I'll ask Stephen to see, say whether he wants to respond there and, and then bring Richard in if you would like to come back on this. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, well, my point is, is very simply this. Through my germline, if I can sort of use myself as the example, through my germline, I am connected to, right the way back, cell after cell after cell, to the original cells. So in one sense, you can say that cells also are immortal replicators. What I'm really beginning to point out here is that the difficulties of language in the way in which we describe the biological information that we have. I think we would have to view Luca as without a doubt a cellular organism, um, and we are the descendants of that cellular organism, although the, um, the continuity, if you like, is the DNA sequence, all the components have been changed. Um, where I take issue with some of Lynn's um, suggestions are in the nature of the um, fusion event that gave rise to eukaryotes. We had the example there of thermoplasma I think he used. Um, that I think is probably the wrong archaeon to pick. Um, I mentioned that in my talk about the Kren archaea and the Uri archaea, the two lineages. Thermoplasma is a Uri archaeon. It lacks all these features that the Kren archaea have that are clearly eukaryotic like in nature. So I would suggest that although the, the fusion idea I agree with totally and the sulfur too, the sulfur, mm -hmm. yeah. the hot temperature. So we, yeah. you're, you'd say we don't have it yet. What? Oh, there are plenty of hypothermophilic trenarchaea that uh, are sulfur utilizing. So you could use one of those instead. And then you would have then you have to ask multiple the origins. You would have escort machinery. You would have um, repetition licensing, all the various components that are eukaryotic. Yeah, we'd have to find one Looking around to see whether anybody else wants to come in at this stage, because we're coming to the last few minutes of the um, formal talk. Um, Eric, would you like to give the last uh, remark on the floor, and then I'm going to give each of us as panelists uh, an opportunity to say something in conclusion. Is that a reasonable way of proceeding, uh, Eric? Uh, Eric Warner, I was just asking Richard. You mentioned the difference between DNA and the cell was that you could modify the DNA and you get a mutation that's replicated. The cell, you can't do that. But, but there is evidence, first of all, that you can do modifications to cells. There are certain papers, I think, where if you modify a cell, it'll actually inherit that independent of the genome. The other thing is, so in effect, the cell in that sense is also a replicator. And then the key thing is about the interaction, since the cell, in effect, is an interpreter of the genome. That means, in effect, that if you modify it in a particular way, then you get a radically different interpretation of the genome, which then, again, results in totally different phenotypes. So, in other words, you could have inheritance by slow modification of the interpreting mechanism, in other words, the cell, as well, right? So you can have evolution by way of interpretation, right? So uh, another way, too, is that if we modify DNA by itself, it does not mean it's going to be inherited because if we modify the wrong part, the cell won't divide, right? So we don't have any inheritance. So both <coughs> the cell and the DNA suffer from exactly the same problem. Both of them can be, have the same problem that certain mutations, so-called, will not lead to replication. Other ones will lead to replication. But I do agree with you in, in one sense that I think the dominant information for the evolutionary change and for the copying, the dominant mechanism does lie in the genome because purely because of its vast informational content, right? Whereas the cell would be more as a vehicle in that sense that, okay, you can modify it, you can modify the interpretation, but in modifying the interpretation, you get radical changes that may not lead to survival, right? But sometimes they can. Okay, that's... I, I'll incorporate my answer in sure. the round okay. in, in the roundup. That's very kind, Richard. Uh, I think we go around the roundup. And Martin, do you want to say anything 
Well, I've I've made some concluding just, remarks. I just said that geologists look fondly on biology as one of its more successful products. <laughs> 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 uh, and that we're learning in geology, uh, after decades of reductionist thinking, that where we've got to look for things like mass extinctions with a big bolide or some single driving mechanism, we have to think in a systems way. Everything is a matter of connections of various sorts. And this connectedness is what I've tried to just hint at in this work we're doing. Uh, and it also shows that uh, the fossil record is a test bed for ideas of how symbiosis and symbiogenesis could work. It's not just a theoretical concept. There is something that you can turn to. Uh, but then I would pass, uh, pass the baton on, I think. But I, I'm being random here, but I wonder, Stephen, would you like to go next? And then we ask Richard, and since this is Lynn's show, we finish off with Lynn. Is that a good way of going? Over to you. I think we've certainly seen the, the, the theme of symbiosis and the way in which the fusion of cellular organisms has undoubtedly developed, led to the development of more complex lineages. What I'd also think we should think more about, though, is the issue of viruses that maybe we should view as uh, not living, but conditionally living to live conditionally within the, uh, the host, but not just as parasites, but also as forces which are shaping content, mechanism, and overall complexity of genomes. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard, over to you. Uh, I, to I want to say that, um, that a cell is not a replicator. A cell is a reproducer, just as an organism is a reproducer. Um, it, an asexual organism, such as an aphid or a, or a female stick insect, um, appears to be a replicator because it appears to give rise by parthenogenesis to an identical daughter. And, and indeed it does. It is not, however, a replicator for the very reason that I was mentioning to Dennis before. If you cut off the leg of an aphid and the aphid then reproduces, as you know, the daughter will not have a missing leg. If you cut off the equivalent of the leg of, of the germline DNA of the aphid, then it will have a, have a change. That is absolutely a straightforward operational definition. Now, the gentleman, now, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. Eric, Eric, Eric Warner. Yes. Um, was saying that there are examples where you can alter a cell in a non-DNA kind of way, and that will be inherited. I, I don't know what you're thinking of there. I mean, uh, one example you might have meant is Sonneborn's um, paramecium, where you, the one is. where you cut the, a bit of the... Pellicle, I think it's called. The, yeah. the, the, the twist water. it round. Yeah. Twist it round. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if that's true, <coughs> and if that is indeed a non a non DNA form of, of heredity, that's absolutely fine. I would embrace that gladly, as a new honorary gene. I mean, that that's fine. <laughs> Why not? Why not? No, no, I have to answer that because we yeah. know what that is. Well, good. Yeah. I, I'm delighted to hear yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 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 e e even if we didn't know. If, if you could find a piece of genuine heredity, which is non-DNA based, and it, by genuine heredity I mean that once the mutation's happened, it potentially goes on forever. Now, of course, it may not go on forever because it may be disadvantageous, but nevertheless, if it has this quality that it doesn't fade away over generations, that's the key point. That's the key point that DNA has, cells do not have, DNA does have, organisms don't have, um, there may be other things that do, and on Mars and on, on Beta, Betel, Goiza, there'll be other kinds of things that, 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 that do that. I'm not wedded to DNA. I am wedded to this operational criterion that alterations in it go on forever, potentially. And that, the reason that matters is that the ones that don't go on forever are the ones that are selected against. But, but in order for that to be evolutionarily interesting, there's got to be a difference between the ones that do go on forever and the ones that don't. And so that's got to be heredity in the broad sense. DNA may very well not be the only kind of, of, of heredity, but, it, but it's got to be something truly inherited in that sense. And, and that, that would be an empirical question, wouldn't it? That would be an empirical yes, question. Right. And, and, and if somebody discovers a sure. new kind of, sure. of heredity, I'd be delighted. Mm. Yes. So one obvious conclusion here is that the, the field of epigenetics has to look very carefully. To see if it fades these away. Possibilities. Yes, that's right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, you're itching to come yeah, back here. I am. I know. I am. Well, uh, I, uh, <laughs> okay, very, very briefly indeed before we ask Lynn to. 
Okay, there are a couple of points. One thing is the interpretive mechanism, right? That can be inherited, right? Because the cell has that structure. Okay, granted that the genome may be used to actually reconstruct the interpretive mechanism. So you could actually mutate it by way of the genome. But also, you could also, there may be certain components of the interpretive mechanism, since it is a three-dimensional structure, which cannot be generated by the one-dimensional structure, yeah. right? So there are three-dimensional top topological things that have to be inherited for this thing to even like work. Like a prion. I mean, that, that, that really yeah, yeah, not just like a prion, but I mean, just the idea of a multi-dimensional structure cannot yeah. be reduced to this one-dimensional structure. So you need, at least at the topological level, in a, in a mathematical way, you do already have inheritance of the topological structure, independent of the genome. If variation is inherited. Yeah. Well, it's, it's differences in here. The point is, it, we have to look at the proper level of abstraction, okay? So you could have an abstract entity inherited in the ten sense that over time, you do have this three-dimensional thing inherited, like Dennis's <coughs> point from the beginning till now, which in effect is inherited, even though it may change in certain characteristics, but looking at it more abstractly in some kind of more topological space, it is inherited in, in your sense. But the other problem was then, once we start calling those genes, uh, we're kind of out of the box. Can, um, I, can I suggest mm -hmm. that we, we, we take this issue of what exactly we mean by genes, honorary genes, and mm -hmm. related questions, and epigenetics mm -hmm. to be part of the later evening discussion? Um, but Richard, you may not have finished your... No, no, no. You have. Okay. Um, Lynn, the, the floor is yours to finish up. Eric took my time. <laughs> I, let, me, let me just answer one thing about the paramecium experiment, which has got, what got me into this to begin with. You saw the mixotrichia, and you saw how there were organisms making up the cortex, and that's what they call it, the ciliate cortex. And that's basically what he did. He picked that he. It was Jeanine Besson, as a matter of fact, who did the experiment. But it's Besson and Sonneborn. What they did is they took a piece of cortex that really was grafted in the opposite direction, and it lasted for two years at a replication, a reproductive rate of one cell per day. So, I mean, it was indefinite, and they never got a different result. And the way to think about that is that the bacteria that they turned around had their DNA in it. I mean, so that, ultimately, that's what it is. And, and they, it's systems thinking. You had to have the whole system of the bacteria, their, their, their protein synthetic system. They're interacting with, with each other. And that perpetrated in that direction. So it's, it's back to systems thinking, group thinking. Okay, well, I think with that thought, we bring the um, formal session to a close. One or two words of thanks. Um, thanks to the panelists for being willing to come to what has been a very exciting discussion, um, and obviously to Martin Brazier, Stephen Bell, uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, Lynn, uh, marvelous, and I've left everybody on myself up there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and come back and